500 throughout the war. In September 1862, a contingent of the Legion was ordered to Powell's Valley near the Cumberland Gap, commanded by Astua Stoga, grandson of a chief. On the march, one of the Cherokee companies was bushwhacked, but Astuga Stoga bravely led a counterattack, driving off the federal soldiers. In late 1862, Confederate authorities ordered Colonel Thomas, his Cherokee name was Will Uzdi, and his Cherokees to Madison County, North Carolina, which is, by the way, where I went to, to a college university, Marshall University, it's in Madison County, where they fought in a number of engagements. Thomas and his Cherokees spent 1863 in Western North Carolina, which I spent a lot of my time when I was going to school there in the beautiful mountains of Western North Carolina. The Legion was sent to join Jubal, General Jubal Early in the Valley Campaign in 1864 in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. The Legion fought in the Battle of Cedar Creek on October 19, 1864. The Shenandoah Valley was recaptured from the Federals. The Legion's final moments of glory came on May 6, 1865. The Legion encountered Federal Mounted Infantry at Waynesville, North Carolina, and surrounded the Federals in the town. During the night of May 5, 1865, the Cherokees built hundreds of campfires to make the Federal garrison think that thousands of Cherokees had surrounded them and were ready to attack them. The Union troops garrisoned in Waynesville, North Carolina surrendered to Thomas's Legion of Cherokees on May 6, 1865. On May 6, 1865, Thomas's Legion fired the last shot of the war in action at White Sulphur Springs, which is today Waynesville, North Carolina. Thomas's Legion of Cherokee Indians was recognized as one of the most courageous and honorable units that the Confederacy ever fielded. On February 21, 1863, the Knoxville Register in Knoxville, Tennessee, Knoxville, Re Knoxville Register newspaper wrote that, and these were the words in the newspaper, an Indian from Thomas's Legion always executes an order with religious fidelity. They scrupulously respect private property. There are no reports of depredations where they are encamped. They are the best scouts in the world. That was from the Knoxville Register during the war, February 21. 1863. Thomas's Legion was never defeated by Union troops. Never. The Cherokee troops that fought under Thomas became increasingly feared by the Federals. They were famous for their skill and their persistence. In post-war years, many of Thomas's Legion Cherokees participated in Confederate reunions well into the 20th century. Due to Thomas's Legion, Federal forces never subjugated Western North Carolina. The Cherokees signed a pledge stating that they would abstain from alcohol. Many Cherokees were Christians. They attended the Baptist Church or the Methodist Church. Thomas's Legion was well known for its fighting prowess. In the OR series 1.53, page 314, it was stated that the Cherokees didn't own any slaves. The Cherokees, as combatants, were rich with skills and abilities. The Cherokees were men of impeccable character, unwavering with loyalty, and were survivors of the infamous Trail of Tears, the Indian Removal Act of 1830 of the federal government. Slavery was not a motive for the Cherokee to fight in that they didn't own any slaves. From their regimental history, 1862-1865, volume three, page 734 states, they had no interest in slavery, present or prospective. Most of them had mountain homes, and be it ever so humble, there is no place like home. But when the Federal Army threatened North Carolina, they fought. One of the Cherokee soldiers of Thomas's Legion received the rare Confederate Medal of Honor. Thomas's Legion, an independent <coughs> command, proved an invaluable service in the defense of vital and strategic railroads and salt works. In 2003, the last surviving Union widow died. Her husband had fought against Thomas's Legion 140 years earlier. And some uh, words about uh, 
Confederate Cherokees from Oklahoma. Other Confederate, Confederate Cherokees units were Drew's Cherokee Mounted Rifles, the 1st Regiment, General Stan Waddy's Cherokee Regiment of Mounted Rifles. Both were from the Cherokee Nation in what was then known as Indian Territory, today the state of Oklahoma. The Cherokee Nation is located in the northeast of Oklahoma around Tulsa. The name Stan Waddy in the Cherokee language means stand firm. Stan Waddy was well known for both his courage and his loyalty to the Confederacy. General Stan Waddy holds two noteworthy distinctions, one being that he is the highest ranking Native American to fight on either side of the, during the war between the states, and the other was that he was the very last Confederate general to surrender after the war. Additionally, the Sons of Confederate Veterans has named a college scholarship after him. Before Stan Waddy's return home after the war, federal soldiers burned Stan Waddy's home to the ground in retaliation for his support of the Confederacy. Stan Waddy died in poverty after the war. Also, the United States government took huge tracts of Cherokee land away from the Cherokee tribe after the war in retaliation for the Cherokee support of the Confederacy. There is uh, one incident uh, noteworthy, I think, about the Cherokees that I'd like to describe to you from Stan Waddy. It was the uh, Battle of Cabin Creek, and the commander of 300 wagon Union supply trains never expected to receive a large group of Native Americans attacking during the dark of night. But Brigadier General Stan Waddy defeated the unsuspecting Federals in the early morning hours of September 19, 1864, at Cabin Creek near the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. The legendary Waddy, only Native American general on either side of the war, planned details of the raid for months. His preparation paid off. The Confederate troops captured wagons with supplies that would be worth today more than $75 million. So that's quite, quite noteworthy, I think, of that daring raid that benefited the Confederacy so much. That's indicative, that's just one example indicative of the Confederate Cherokees, and that was, again, uh, Stan Waddy on the Oklahoma side. But uh, I've gone at some length about Cherokees from North Carolina under Thomas's Legion, how uh, they fought. So, as I said again, uh, never was there a more honorable or courageous unit of Confederacy ever feel it than Thomas's Legion of North Carolina. So, uh, that is it. It's short, but uh, I think you get the gist of these brave and noble, remarkable fighting men that uh, did not fight for anything other than to protect their homes, uh, their homeland. So, uh, anybody has any <coughs> questions or any comments? Uh, it would be fine. Yes, sir. The uh, one question talking about Stan Waddy, uh, I, I assume, but I don't know, has there ever been a, a, a <clears throat> Native American general in any American war who has outranked him? <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure. I've just you know, looked at the uh, war between the states. He was the highest ranking Native American on either side. I'm sure, it was a number of years the before states. there was any that anybody who ever would have outranked him in any other war. Um, but it'd be interesting to know whether he's still the, the highest ranked uh, Native American. Don't know, don't, I don't know that <clears throat> answer that question, but he was definitely the highest ranking Native American in that war. And, and you, did you say that Thomas's legion was at the Battle of Cedar Creek? Yes. And how did they manage to avoid being defeated there? Uh, well, they, they're, they're part of the action. Uh, they were not defeated. Of course, that, that, there was ultimately a, a Confederate feat, uh, defeat. But uh, during their part of the battle, who they were facing, they were not defeated. They were never defeated during the war. As an in, certainly the independent command, they were never right. defeated. Right. No record of any defeat on their part during the entire war. From 1862 to the end. And what did they do with the uh, prisoners they, they captured in May of 1865? Well, uh, again, that was toward the end of the war. Well, no, I mean, they had no, no prisoner of war camp to send them to. No, no, uh, again, they were defeated, but then they were just let go. But it was right at the end of the war. Of course, Lee had surrendered in, in April of 1865. And, and then uh, uh, 
Uh, I assume Johnston had also Johnston surrendered. Johnston right afterwards, so it was basically so the end before of Johnston war. surrendered. Yeah. Well, just, <clears throat> do you uh, do you know if Thomas's legion fought in terms of infantry and cavalry arms? Can the European stand up, shoot them up style, or did they use other tactics? Well, Native Americans <clears throat> were very adept to to uh, using the land and cover. So uh, they, they didn't use like box squares, which comes from Europe uh, from centuries ago, but uh, like behind trees, rocks. So they're very, very, uh, they were very skilled fighters, uh, very persistent, very loyal, and uh, tremendous scouts. So they, they, uh, they fought very well. They, they used the land, but they knew so well. One more question. Did the, did both groups, East and West, fight under the Cherokee Braves flag, or was that more East or more West? Uh, not so sure. Not so sure about that. I know that the uh, Cherokees in Oklahoma had uh, uh, Stan Wadi use that. I'm not sure about the flag they used in the East under Thomas's Legion. Interesting that uh, here, the separation of Cherokees in Oklahoma and North Carolina came about, which I mentioned, the Trail of Tears. Indian Removal Act, 1830, and there were a number of uh, forced marches to Indian territory. The ones in North Carolina, the ones that hit out in caves, escaped that removal. And uh, interesting, uh, in uh, North Carolina, uh, when I was there, I saw the Eternal Flame, and that's when Cherokees from North Carolina uh, uh, took flame and went to Oklahoma, and Oklahoma back to North Carolina. So they both had the same flame uh, kept alive in two different separate parts of the Cherokee Nation, Oklahoma and North Carolina. So I saw the one in the uh, uh, the amphitheater where they have under these hills about Cherokee history where that is kept. The Cherokee Museum, if you have a chance to go there, I've not been to the <coughs> Oklahoma part, but the, in North Carolina there's a great museum, uh, Cherokee Museum. There's a uh, uh, Cherokee village from the 17th century recreated. There's the Onto These Hills uh, drama of Cherokee history there, so there's a lot to see and do. And beautiful country, uh, great fishing, and the Soko Creek, Okonolukti. Uh, so it's just a wonderful place to go to. So I highly recommend anybody who hasn't been to take, take a visit there. Uh, you won't be disappointed. Well, which raises the other question of how long did they have to stay in isolation before they felt it was safe to come out and assimilate or, or let them know, let, he, let it well, be known they were still there. It's interesting, uh, the land was taken away from them, <laughs> but through Will Thomas, after the war, uh, they gave him money and in that they couldn't buy back their own land. Through him, a white man, they purchased their land back and there you have today the Cherokee follow boundary in North Carolina. They purchased their own land back through a white man, Will Thomas. So until then, they were living on land that they didn't own? Uh, well, they, they hid out in caves during the removal, so they were able to buy back their own land through a white man. Yes? Um, and a number of uh, Native Americans who were not Cherokee fought for the Confederacy, particularly the Shot Caller Creek. Correct. I don't hear as much about them. I know. Uh, it might be because Stan Wadi was famous and Thomas Legion was famous, but do you know anything about the, what the Choctaw and Creek did? Choctaw was considered uh, uh, outstandingly the most loyal tribe uh, of the five, five tribes in the South to the Confederacy. Uh, solid support. Uh, there were was, there was some divisions amongst other tribes, you know, the Creeks, uh, other tribes were Seminoles, uh, but uh, Choctaws, uh, great support for the Confederacy. And you're right, you don't hear as much about them. Uh, but uh, well, the Seminoles were the, the cattle cavalry. The Seminoles uh, were raising beef cattle for the Confederate Army. And it was uh, not much combat, but uh, very famous in the logistical part of it. Right, there was, a, again, support not only Cherokee, yeah. but the Creeks, the Choctaws, the Seminoles, uh, called the five civilized tribes yeah. in the South. <coughs> And the, uh, the uh, Choctaws, I visited their reservation as well in the Mississippi, and uh, another great place. Very, in fact, uh, uh, they're one of the large, the, the, they're very progressive 
one of the largest uh, employers in the state of Mississippi. They've done tremendous things with, with their resources and have, have just multiplied it. And they're just a, a great inspiration. Uh, the Choctaw tribe in Mississippi that employed so many people. Uh, and not, not only that, if you're a Choctaw and you need a job, you want a job, you're guaranteed a job. If you're a Choctaw and you want to go to college, you're guaranteed to go to college. I mean, they're, they're that well advanced and that well progressive, so uh, they've done tremendous things for their tribe, the people, and for the state of Mississippi. <coughs> William Holland Thomas was related to, I believe it was Zachary Taylor, is that right? Uh, I did read up on his bi biography. Uh, he may have been. I, he, I, he was I a cousin. Right. He was a cousin to Zachary Taylor mm -hmm. and a cousin to Jefferson Davis. Right. Of course, Jefferson Davis was so related to Zachary Taylor. So when he Taylor. needed something, mm -hmm. uh, he'd send a dispatch to Jeff Davis, and it would get handled. And as a young as a young man, he was. Uh, uh, he, he operated a trading post with a partner and the, the partner took him in, took him under his wing and this was very, very successful there in, in I believe it was Waynesville and the money that they made uh, went, he saved that money and it went to buying the land because the Cherokees at that point could not own land. Right. And so he he amassed his fortune and over time bought land all around that area. And the, the old chief knew what was what he was doing. And in honor to him, when the old chief was uh, on his deathbed, he gathered the council around and told them that their new chief was going to be William Howard, Howard Thomas, the only all-white chief in Cher uh, the Cherokee Indian. And it was as chief that he amassed this legion because they were his, they were his tribe. And uh, he did that in... in uh, 1862, but before that, he had been a, a senator from North Carolina in, the, in, the, uh, in Raleigh. He had been a representative. He was a lawyer. So he was very connected to be able to, to do for the Indians what needed to be done. Another famous uh, chief of the Cherokee during the removal, in fact, was John Ross, who was, who was not all Cherokee. His father was a white trader uh, amongst the Cherokees, and his mother was was, uh, was uh, Cherokee. And then somebody else, I should, even though we're talking about Cherokees, we sh I should not uh, be able to mention, but it was a sequoia. You hear the famous sequoia trees out in California? Well, sequoia.